Well, I'm going to um, uh, hopefully contribute to the discussion here with uh, covering some initiatives and some consumer research that we've done that really is trying to get a handle on this whole uh, image of agriculture that's already been touched on and what is it that we can do about it. So I'm hoping that what I share today uh, will help with that. And I do want to thank um, Scott for inviting me uh, to this forum. And I, I hope I can uh, meet many of you uh, before the conference is over over and um, we are looking for more and more partnerships on things that we're trying to do and I think that's what it's all about. Well, for those of you that are not familiar with Ithic, we are based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've ex existed since 1985 to communicate science-based information on food safety and nutrition issues uh, to those uh, opinion leaders that consumers are most likely to trust, journalists, health professionals, uh, government officials, and others. We're supported primarily by the food, beverage, and agricultural industries. Uh, our website lists all of our members. We uh, currently have 36 supporting members uh, of Ithic. And, um, even though we're supported by the industry, we don't actually represent them. So we don't do lobbying or regulatory advocacy, uh, but we advocate on the science-based information for food safety and nutrition. Uh, many of our uh, supporting members are either the uh, heads of communications or heads of R&D, uh, scientific affairs, uh, that sort of thing that sit around our board table. And I can tell you among them, there's been a constant frustration over the last at least five years on why are processed foods being attacked all the time, why is large-scale agriculture being attacked all the time. So uh, we've done some um, work in, in looking at all of this. And I will say in the uh, animal ag area, uh, some of the uh, companies that support this would include Sara Lee, uh, Kraft with the Oscar Mayer brands, of course Cargill, uh, we have McDonald's, Yum Brands. So it's an interesting mix of, uh, along the value chain of, of companies who really believe in the important mission of getting good, accurate information before the public and then let public make decisions based on informed choices, not on misinformation. Uh, this is a list of some of the partners we've worked with over the years. Uh, we um, always try to identify who is the most expert group on a, on a given issue that consumers would be most likely to trust. And as we put out a consumer brochure or publication or increasingly just a website Q&A, uh, who would be the group that they would be most likely to trust? In some cases, it's government agencies. Uh, we work with the USDA on the My Pyramid brochure on, on healthful eating. So that was a partnership of uh, IFIC and the uh, um, the Food Marketing Institute and the USDA. Uh, we have worked with the uh, AVMA uh, back when the BSE issue uh, was really at its peak. Uh, we came up with some publications called Animal Diseases in the News because there was a lot of confusion at that time about avian influenza, about BSE. So we um, look forward to working in partnerships and we're always looking for, for new partnerships uh, on the issues of the day. And this is our website uh, for our Ithic Foundation, which is at uh, foodinsight.org. A wealth of information on there that I hope would be helpful to your customers, your um, colleagues. When issues come up within food safety and nutrition, in many cases we may have blogged about the issue. Uh, we've updated our site recently with all the social media bells and whistles. Uh, we've got a monthly newsletter that comes uh, electronically. You can sign up right from the homepage here, and that's the Food Insight newsletter. And we may, we may have touched on a hot topic uh, that you're hearing about in the news. And if you're wondering where you can go to get a good balanced portrayal and uh, sort of the bottom line of the story, uh, that's how we're trying to position our information. Well, as I mentioned, uh, with the frustration of what was going on in the environment about um, you know, attacks on agriculture, attacks on processed foods, and this sort of frustration that nobody was really speaking up against it, in 2008, uh, we worked with a number of groups uh, in the industry to really take a look at environmental analysis on what was out there. Uh, and we decided before we tried to do any sort of communications, we really needed to understand the environment. We had a lot of hypotheses about it. Uh, but we did an environmental analysis looking at the social, political, and economic uh, issues uh, related to all of these topics. And not surprisingly, we found at that time that uh, all of these areas were really mostly negative towards processed foods as a category. 
Uh, the obesity epidemic, which, which is another issue that we've addressed for years, uh, trying to get good information out, raise awareness on this, but that's been a significant factor as, in many cases, processed foods or uh, even large-scale uh, farming has been blamed for causing the obesity crisis. And then finally, you know, the benefits of processed foods, when you really look at coverage on this, are not really being communicated clearly and consistency, consistently uh, as a category. You'll find companies will promote their own products, and in fact, even you know, many of our own member companies are out there promoting organic and natural uh, versions of their products, and they're not really talking about any other production uh, area other than these hot areas, even though they've got lots of traditional products out there. But we found, just as a snapshot of, I think it was about three months at the time of coverage and dialogue on social media, it was about 90% negative. If you, if you put in the phrase uh, food processing, processed food, uh, very few people uh, making newsprint uh, on the on the uh, traditional media or the or the uh, social, saying much about the pro benefits of processed foods. And it just seemed like, you know, as I look at my own life, I had an aunt who was a county extension agent in Kentucky and, you know, went around teaching the, the benefits of canning and capturing uh, fruits and vegetables at their peak of ripeness, peak of nutrition. And, you know, working with um, my mother who had grown up on, on a farm and just, you know, sort of knew by nature how to, how to uh, keep animal products safely, uh, safe, uh, how to cook them right, cook them flavorfully. And um, so I think many consumers... And our generation took this for granted until now we really have another generation that's very disconnected from agriculture. Uh, and of course that's what uh, Clint identified with in his, his great presentation on that. So it's a real issue. Uh, so when somebody, so when the industry overall is rather silent, everybody's kind of doing their own thing, selling their own products, and you have a lot of noise coming about how bad agriculture is, in a way it's really not surprising that consumers seem to hear mostly negative information because there has to be some balance out there. Well, so we took this initial uh, analysis and decided to uh, do a more scientific survey. We do a lot of consumer research, and we decided it would be better to uh, come up with some real representative data uh, to see if we can better understand the attitudes that were out there. So we did, uh, in working with this coalition of groups, uh, conducted an online survey in December 2008. This was the Artemis Strategy Group uh, out of Washington, and it was a 500-person um, survey of the U.S. who were primary grocery shops. So it was representative of the whole U.S. population. And we wanted to find out what were the people most concerned about when it came to processed foods, uh, what is their potential impact of deselection or literally not buying products, uh, were they just saying they weren't going to buy them or were they really not going to, and then what are the message opportunities, are there ways to talk about the food production and agriculture processed foods that might uh, be better than what we are doing currently. Well, this is a little bit highly summarized, but we found that consumers do have very negative perceptions of processed foods. They're deeply rooted, cut across all demographics, so it wasn't just a you know East Coast, West Coast thing. Uh, we found that it was uh, really among most consumers. Uh, certain ingredients uh, they connected to having a high level of association with processed foods, and I'll show you those in a minute. And then we found that, uh, at least attitudinally, uh, the concerns were leading to an intention to consume less of a of a wide category of products. Uh, on the other hand, we did find that there were some positive associations uh, with processed foods, almost um, a little bit of a guilt assigned with consuming processed foods, you know, an acknowledgement and uh, an acknowledgement of some of the reasons that they did, and that was value, uh, consistency of product, and convenience based on busy lifestyles. So in terms of um, you know, looking at the term processed foods uh, on its own without any you know, benefits articulated, we think 43% of consumers rate themselves unfavorable compared to only 18% willing to say they're favorable. And then the ingredients that they associate with um, uh, processed foods, sodium, trans fat, and high fructose corn syrup stand out as ones that they would always cite when you tried to give, give them to give examples of processed foods. 
Um, actually, those who considered themselves foodies or more knowledgeable about food in general um, tended to have even more negative views uh, about processed foods. And then uh, what surprised us here is a relatively small proportion said that they had heard any media coverage about processed foods recently, uh, so it meant that there were really many other sources uh, of information coming out beyond just the news media uh, that had, had perhaps led to these opinions. So when we look at um, on a spectrum here in terms of um, you have the 43% unfavorable, 18% favorable, but another 40% sort of neutral on the term. And that, that is an opportunity for education or that they haven't been completely lost uh, on the issue at this point. Uh, but of those who said that they were unfavorable, they do tend to be uh, married women uh, with children living at home. They have a higher educational level uh, and higher income, uh, tend to be uh, Caucasian uh, as well. Now, interestingly, when we ask about the different types of food that consumers eat, um, while uh, almost two-thirds say that they eat organic uh, and almost everybody fresh, almost everybody also says that they eat processed foods as well. Uh, and you see we looked at different categories as junk food, fast food, even pretty high numbers for those. Uh, so a lot of different uh, food types that consumers acknowledge that they're eating. Now this was a, um, a chart that we developed uh, trying to get a handle on the potential for deselection uh, here. And so you see at the bottom you have processed foods, junk foods, et cetera, and there wasn't any individual product that scored as low, uh, but without going into the whole algorithm on this, you know, when you look at very few, very few categories did consumers say they intend to consume more on here, but notably for this group, poultry uh, was one uh, that they said they were going to increase somewhat, uh, whole grains, fresh fruit uh, up there. Um, so you look at a lot of foods that are being targeted, at least attitudinally by many consumers. Um, but I will caveat this again to say that we don't, we didn't measure in this survey actual buying behavior. And the one you could really point that out, look at all the people saying that they're going to consume less wine and beer, and I just don't take them seriously. <laughs> I'm sure if we looked at the data that would not have happened in 2008. So. Now also, interestingly, when we ask, give them a number of attributes about food and ask what is most important to them when they're purchasing foods or beverages, taste is number one. And we've tested this in other surveys too. Uh, it doesn't really matter what other factors you throw up there, health, convenience, et cetera, taste is most important. So consumers are not gonna trade off taste for these other attributes. They really expect taste. Uh, and if you're gonna certainly try anything new, you've gotta meet the taste expectations, whether it's uh, fresh or healthful, uh, et cetera. But what's interesting, when you look at this list, the uh, you might argue that freshness is not associated with many processed foods, but taste, safety, cost, value really are uh, attributes of many processed foods out there. So there's, there's some opportunity there in terms of positioning the products. So from the survey, we found that um, there are some generally accepted strengths of processed foods. They're acknowledged to be a critical component of most people's diets every day. Maybe they don't feel good about that, but they are there. Uh, they're seen as a good value for the money, um, but despite the strengths, processed food has really become uh, default for everything negative. You know, we see we work with a, a lot of experts. Uh, we have a media guide of about 350 experts on various aspects of food safety and nutrition who are willing to be referred by us to the media we don't pay them for this, but some people that are very good on certain topics will go on the Today Show and say, you know, if you just want to be healthy, just don't eat processed foods. And it's like, you know, you know, what are you really saying when you have a statement like that? So that's the way the term has been thrown around uh, by even very responsible experts. So the negative experts, neg negative perceptions have cut across the whole population. And again, there's just really not a voice speaking up about any benefits. So there is an opportunity to remind consumers about those benefits that, that came so naturally to my aunt uh, in, in Kentucky and to us growing up. And I did want to call to your attention, um, as we started moving forward with what we could do about this, we worked with the Institute of Food Technologists who put together a multidisciplinary group to do a review of uh, history, uh, contributions, and the current controversies regarding food processing and technology. It really was a farm-to-fork approach. 
And they wrote a, um, an article in Critical Reviews in Food Science and Food Safety that we commissioned. Uh, it was published in September last year. It's available online, uh, but called Feeding the Future. And it was really a remind, a good chronicle reminder uh, of all this. So we did, uh, they, we and they promoted that to mainly in an opinion leader group and used that as a foundational training tool and then also used that as a foundation for developing a communications toolkit that we thought uh, could be more helpful in getting messages out to the populations that we work with and those who are communicating to consumers. So we had a, a concept working with a group uh, called Food Minds uh, to develop the toolkit to provide background and teaching tools to help communicators uh, talk about food production and food processing, help to clear up the misperceptions uh, about large-scale agriculture to provide the facts about uses and benefits. It's really designed at a reading level for almost anyone, uh, but it is intended for um, ag, food, and nutrition opinion leaders, health professionals, industry members, and others. And we are targeting, uh, with this, primary grocery shoppers, uh, as well as those who've identified themselves as somewhat unfavorable toward processed foods. You know, I do think there's a category of consumers, maybe it's 10% uh, or less, that are so sold on anti-processed foods and only organic natural. That's, it's going to be hard to communicate them or design your messages to appeal to that group. I think you've got to go to the rest of the 80 90% uh, out there. So uh, in developing our toolkit, we worked with some academic advisors uh, as well as our supporters to um, try to come up with a way, we knew a quick message wasn't going to get the job done on this, but try to come up with a, a message continuum. So first, really defining what we're talking about uh, when we mean processed foods. You know, most of the foods we eat, in fact, are processed in some way. And we talked about this is really most of the foods available in grocery stores, even the ones labeled natural and organic, are actually processed foods uh, when you think about it. Uh, fortified foods, um, even foods served in restaurants certainly meet the definition. But part of the thing, and we worked off the uh, Institute of Food Technology's definitions, was talk about processing as a continuum. So you have minimally processed, uh, you know, simply washing uh, apples or, uh, you know, slicing up cuts of meat, uh, of course. Uh, but then, uh, you know, further processing to preserve and enhance nutrients, uh, packaging, ready-to-eat products like cereal uh, that are uh, more processed, and then, you know, highly processed processed snack foods as well or packaged meals to extend resources. So really giving a full uh, continuum for consumers to think about. Then we developed a, a list of messages, uh, which we, we did eventually test. Uh, and these will sound very basic to many of you in this room, but I think it's really important to take consumers through this. Uh, and, and in many cases, they're, they're not hearing these kind of very basic messages and jumping to conclusions about their food supply. So number one, a safe, tasty, high quality, affordable food. Uh, the concepts, our food production system today delivers safe, tasty, high quality, affordable food to your fort. Farmers in partnership with food manufacturers, uh, food service establishments and others bring an abundance of choices to your family table or restaurant menu offering a wide spectrum of high quality flavors and nutrients. Uh, number two, the endless choices that agriculture provides. Food producers offer endless choices of foods and ingredients to prepare or add to your meals. When planning your meals for the day or week, processed foods are among the many options to pick from depending on your lifestyle, personal preference, and dietary needs. And in our messaging, I'll point out too, you won't hear anything negative about natural organic. The whole idea is about consumer choice, but again, we want that choice to be informed um, when it's given to them. A third concept, time-saving and nutritious products. Food processing makes it possible to help to have time-saving nutritious products to help make meal preparation easy for today's busy families. And with those busy lifestyles, everyone needs a little help getting a nutritious meal on the table. Your grocer can help with fast, affordable, flavorful options regardless of the size of your family. <laughs> And four, the concept, you can't grow it in your backyard all year. Uh, with modern agriculture, it's possible to enjoy your favorite foods all year long. Without the advancement of global food systems, many of your favorite foods would only be available for short times uh, of the year. And with modern food production, a variety of your family's favorite foods are available each and every day, no matter where you live. Well, so we took, we took the uh, messages that we had developed and we tested them 
uh, with a, a, an early mock-up of our communications kit. We want to understand the consumer reactions to the toolkit content, gauge their level of interest in the messages, the importance and believability of them as well. And so we had a couple of uh, subgroups. So this was online research. Uh, one group were primary grocery shoppers, uh, and, number, and the second group was the group who had defi defined themselves as somewhat unfavorable to the processed foods category. Uh, so this was done by strategic intent in 2010, and we re used a repeated measures design. So where they um, we tested their attitudes first, then gave them the communications toolkit to read, and tested attitudes afterwards. So really, this slide says it all, and so we believe just getting these messages out in front of many more consumers can make a difference. So the first group of primary grocery shoppers who started with a 34% favorability um, actually went up nearly 20% after reading the material uh, in its entirety. And then the uh, group who had, had started really from a zero support standpoint, they were down as somewhat unfavorable, jumped 40% uh, in favorability after reading the messages. So to give you a flavor of, of some of the comments uh, from the consumers, uh, there's more to processed food than I thought. I had no idea processed food was so prevalent, even in ways one would not think, such as natural or organic. And this message is relevant because everyone always says processed food is bad for you when almost everything they eat, including myself, is in fact processed food. So what we learned from this was that consumers are generally favorable to processed foods once provided the correct definition, uh, what they encompass, and the benefits they can provide. And it is important to, to incorporate the definitional core idea, um, the continuum of, of processing that we talked about, and the message concepts together uh, because they each represent different and believable aspects of how consumers relate to food. And it does make a case, stronger case for the benefits for consumers. So the way our communications toolkit is designed, we have a leader guide uh, with tips for health professionals and other communicators, and then we have five reproducible handouts, and all of this is available on our website uh, at foodinsight.org. Uh, the first one is what are processed foods, you might be surprised goes into the continuum definition. Uh, second, from farm to your fork, what food processing brings to your plate. And then your food's your choice. Again, that you have a wide range of choices out there. Uh, foods to, to fit your busy lifestyle, the convenience idea. And then that year-round availability of, of the wealth of things that the food supply provides. So this is what they look like, and again, you can download them uh, in color uh, from our website. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback from a number of groups who have already taken a look at this. So it really helps to point out for consumers to really get them thinking a little bit more. You know, what, at what point do you want to quit processed foods? You know, for, for if you take a look at something like corn, you can do the same thing with tomato sauce and figure out <clears throat> what would you give up, uh, which part of your food supply. And I think it becomes logical to them when, when they see this. So the, those who helped us put this together were uh, uh, ag leaders from Cor <coughs> excuse me, Cornell University, Purdue, UC Davis, University of Florida, and then some of the professional societies we worked with, American Dietetic Association, Institute of Food Technologists, American Society for Nutrition, and CAST, the Council for Ag Science and Technology. Uh, we also have on our website uh, resources on modern food production where we've interviewed experts. Um, we actually tried to respond without responding directly to the movie Food Inc. Uh, when that came out, we put together a lot of these materials because there was a lot of misinformation related to that movie. And without bashing them, we don't like to go head to head. Uh, you know, we think everybody's, uh, it's fine to contribute to the dialogue, but we wanted to make good information available. So many groups uh, help point to our information uh, for this. So again, if if you need this kind of resource, it is up there on our website in uh, videos as well as print papers. papers. Well, so even though um, we feel like we've come up with some good information that we can get out as an organization, we know it's just a drop in the bucket for what we can really accomplish communicating with our own audiences. We don't have tons of resources uh, ourselves, and we've long felt that we've got to work in partnership. As I mentioned, it's been a model for IFIC early on, um, but our, our board started feeling like as there are a lot of uh, agricultural initiatives springing up, uh, food and agriculture, there's a feeling like once again is the industry 
working at this issue in a siloed fashion. So they asked if we could convene a lot of the organizations in food and agriculture and talk about how we could all align and work more closely together to get good messages out. So last August, uh, we hosted a meeting in Washington um, called Convening Great Minds in Food and Agriculture. And we brought together uh, 60 representatives from 40 different organizations across food and ag. Many of them didn't know each other, didn't know some of the organizations existed, didn't know about some of the great initiatives such as the uh, U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance um, that is formed at that time. It was still in the formative stages. And we had a kind of an all-day facilitated discussion to talk about what was going on, how we could better work together, and was there was it important for these groups to keep talking to each other. And it was a very positive dialogue, and um, it did lead to the formation of a, an alliance that we've put together called the Alliance to Feed the Future. And this was really meant to be an information sharing group. Uh, it's not going to have the kind of communication resources that the Farmers and Ranchers Alliance uh, hopes to have, but it will multiply the impact of separate efforts that build understanding of food production and technology issues among key stakeholders to balance the public dialogue on modern ag and large-scale food production. And. Uh, what we what we see is an umbrella network that can connect information and various initiatives and try to make them more effective by adding exposure. So if, whether it's the Farmers and Ranch Alliance or and there's a group called the Food Leaders Group in Washington that's trying to be more of an advocacy group uh, on policy issues, if we can make our information delivery more efficient, sharing good quality information, but then as IFIC is used to working in, we wanted to bring in more credible partners uh, to add to the credibility of messages. So we've brought in university partners, professional societies, uh, so our alliance will, will really be an information sharing alliance among all of these different groups and we hope to have government agencies uh, in as well. And there'll be, there's a public website that was already launched on Ag Day on March 15th, and we will also be building out a, a member website uh, to really allow us to share resources with each other, uh, certain needs, allow for a heads up if there's some issues breaking in certain uh, categories, so just to better communicate with each other in a cost-effective way. And I'm very pleased uh, that we have uh, 58 uh, member organizations already that cut across uh, many areas of agriculture. I uh, was very pleased uh, that when uh, Scott informed us that the um, uh, National Institute of Animal Agriculture and National Livestock Producers Association <coughs> would join the alliance. And you see uh, others involved in animal agriculture, the National Chicken Council, National Turkey Federation are there. There are certainly groups that aren't there yet that we hope will be there. We want to get the, the farm and Ranchers Alliance uh, aligned with us. I hope to see them there. And I would just ask any of you, whether you're university-based or, or government or other groups that you don't see on the list, we'd love to have you. There's no cost to join, um, but it's just sort of a common agreement with our overall mission and willing to communicate. We'll be having a meeting in Washington April 27th uh, from 2 to 4. And so even folks that haven't made a decision to join, if you wanted to come and hear the discussion on how you can help, uh, we'd love to have you. And we've got a phone option uh, as well uh, if you would like to do that. So we're very pleased about the possibilities with this, but we are also realistic that this will be a long-term communications effort. It needs to be sustained because, as you know, getting accurate news, good news out is much harder than getting controversial, inaccurate news that's not accountable out. And that's the challenge that, that all of us have going forward.